Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 361 for Tuesday, November 1st, 2022. Folks, and welcome back to Gig Gab, or welcome if it's your first time. We are the show by, for, and about working musicians here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Napomo, California, Paul Kent. Yeah, man. So uh, it's been a while. Um, it has been a while. <laughs> <laughs> we had we had some some scheduling mayhem that we knew about, but it doesn't change the fact that we had scheduling mayhem. So yeah, here. Uh, I don't think we've ever in the in the what seven eight years we've been doing this, we've ever had three weeks off, right? Is that what it was? Was it three full weeks off? I guess it was, wasn't it? I think so. yeah. yeah, amazing, amazing. Well, we're here. I had a um, I had a busy gig weekend or a full gig weekend. Um, Supposed to have had four gigs for Halloween weekend. It turned out to be only three. Uh, we had to cancel a bitter pill gig because of some. Uh, I think I can say this. Billy posted it publicly on Facebook. So, but Billy wasn't like really was under the weather um, on Saturday night. So we we bailed on that gig, uh, which I mean it turned out was the right move. But um, we played Friday over in Manchester at the Shaskeen, which is like this. It's this Irish pub bar slash rock club thing. We played with um, Paul Jarvis, who plays solo bass, opened up the night, and then Wizard S uh, played second, and then we played third. And it was it was a fun night. It was fun playing in a, you know, just a big rock club kind of thing. And uh, what's, good st- what's big? Oh, I mean, not not huge. Just like a room that's meant for loud rock and roll. That, that I, I meant like not big club, but big rock club, you know, big. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, we all wore costumes and, you know, it was, it was a fun night band played actually band played. Well, we had, um, the sound engineer was, he was good. It was, you know, I, I've talked on the show about how I had my litmus test for how much I should be asking any given engineer for and how I introduce myself to him. And, you know, the, the whole rigmarole that I go through where I, I, I provide lots of helpful tips up front and then, you know, use that to sort of feel out the engineer and then ask for, for different things throughout. And he, it turned out, I mean, he was a fantastic engineer. He actually chose to mix my ears. And that's usually a warning sign when the engineer says, no, I'll mix your ears for you. It's like, Oh, okay. Uh-oh. Yeah. Uh Oh, exactly. Yeah. But I, I mean, my mix was good all night. So I, I had nothing to complain about. Like he, he's like, no, I know I, I, I got this. I'm like, okay, I've heard this before, but yeah, it was fine. You know, it was, it worked out. So, and for a one setter with a quick changeover, uh, it was, you know, it was, it was good. It worked out, worked out well. People said the sound in the club was good. Band played well. So, you know, and, and, and I liked all the people that, that we played on the bill with wizard S is, uh, some other friends of ours. In fact, John, our guitar player in Bitter Pill, also plays in Wizard S. And the drummer in Wizard S and I shared my kit. And he's a uh, he's a g- great drummer and a good friend. And so Rick Habib. And it was you know it was just nice watching friends play. And good hang. It was a good hang. Abs. That's exactly right. It was a good hang. And that man, that's an important thing for a gig. <laughs> it is. Yeah. And then uh, and then I did two performances of. Rocky Horror uh, in less than 24 hours. We did it at midnight on Sunday night and then again at like nine o'clock on Monday night right after there's a big Halloween parade in Portsmouth. And and so we did it right after that. Um, and both show the, the Halloween show was totally sold out. And even Sunday night at midnight, uh, there were, you know, almost 200 people in the room. I, I like, that's a lot of degenerates being ready to to party at midnight on a Sunday night. I guess that's my kind of people, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It just it was like when they told me about the dates for the gig, I'm like, don't you mean we're doing it Saturday night at midnight and then Monday at the parade? They're like, no, it's Sunday night at midnight. I'm thinking, what the heck is going to come out at Sunday night at midnight? And like the bar had a huge night. So I was like, okay, yep, yep. I know what kind of people come out for this. Okay. <laughs> but um, That's good. It was good. Yeah. You know, for this one, the band wasn't on stage, which is a really weird thing for me in general. 
and especially for Rocky Horror, uh, where so much of the crowd interaction sort of drives the show. Uh, it, it was weird. And, and there was one point where I thought about it. I'm like, you know, we're sitting here in the band pit. Every, the, all the musicians are set up. We're facing each other, essentially in a circle. And it's like, you know, this feels like band rehearsal. I mean, it looks like band rehearsal. If somebody walked in, they'd think we were having band rehearsal. The problem is there's, you know, 20 people out on stage that are utterly relying on us not to have band rehearsal and <laughs> instead play the show, you know, uh, but it's just, yeah, it's weird. It's a weird detached thing, not like being able to share space with the people that I'm playing with. I don't know. It's weird. Uh, I don't know how to describe it other than, mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's weird. But the shows went well. It was fine. You know, easy. Go bang drum. Bang drum. Yeah. yeah. So, do you have some Halloween? So, Go ahead. Yeah. I, I will tell you about our Halloween gigs, but oh. you know, I, I, we get so amped up to do this thing we love to do and 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 we often attach so much anticipation and expectation and and uh it, you know it it's cool because it's it is almost always that fulfilling even though we assign that expectation to it but you know if you're doing it 250 300 days of the year it is kind of a job and your ability to kind of even out the highs and lows is probably a, a useful life skill. Wouldn't you say? Yeah, I, I agree with that. Yeah. 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 I, I, yeah. I'm, I'm thankful to not be doing it 200 days a year or even a hundred. Oh, I guess it's probably about a hundred days a year, right? Somewhere in there. But yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. It's it, it, because it can get to be a grind like anything else, you know, you just like, Oh, time, time to go do it again. Okay. Let's go. You know, kind of happens. Yeah. I want to hear about your gigs. I have a I have a PSA to share with people as well, but I, I want to hear about your gigs before sure, before I well, get into the negative Nelly stuff. Yeah, so I was gone for two weeks mm. and I didn't didn't have a guitar in my hand, couldn't sing, couldn't couldn't you know do warm ups, anything like that. I was gone for two weeks, got back and immediately went to do a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and interestingly, my voice was very different. Oh. and again, I'm. I my voice was in a really good place before I left. I mean, it was, it, it, you know, tonality and range. You know, I had sung so much for the past six months, and was incredibly diligent about warm ups every single time. Mm. I really thought that I was affecting my voice in a really powerful, positive way. And it was interesting because after this two weeks, you'd think your voice would be rested, but I actually had a hard time. And it was all sorts of different hard times. I don't know if I'm a little bit sick. I oh, I yeah. definitely have a little bit of resonance. You know, I can't quite feel when I'm going for certain notes. I can't quite feel it right. My voice was cracking in, in interesting, unexpected ways. There was just a bunch of stuff that was different from when I, do before you, I took the time off. Do you and have I was fall, expecting that. Do you have fall allergies going on out there? We definitely have that here. That's why it comes to mind. I, I. I have allergies in general right, and right, there's definitely right. something going on where, you know, there's just a lot of more crud in the back of my throat right now. There's, yep. there's, um, and like I said, it was just, it was, I was expecting to be well rested and to pick up where I left off and better, but it was, it was different. And it was kind of funny different because the third of the three shows, the Sunday afternoon show was probably the best, you know, it was like yeah. my voice was, had that kind of a rich quality to it, um, not tired. And and the second show was a house rockers gig, which, you know, I, I luckily I think I've finally gotten my rhythm with with in ears, and I'm clearly not stressing as much as I used to without in ears, and so I'm not fatiguing my voice. But anyway, just a whole mixed bag of things. And again, I'm not a, I have to work five times harder than most people to, to stay average at my singing. Right. <laughs> I just, I have to, I have to warm up. I have to really get in a zone. I have to pay a lot of attention and think a lot, you know, about, about what's sounding right and feeling right. And, you know, placement of, of the buzz and all that stuff. Yep. So it, 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 it is an intellectual pursuit for me to try and be able to, you know, carry a tune. So um, it was just a weird weekend of that. But that said, Many other things went well through these gigs. I mean, I, the the third the Friday night gig, 
um, Chris Breen couldn't make it, my keyboard player. So I brought in a, a friend who is a violinist. And so just a different sound taking the solos. And, and, and that is a, that's my coffee house gig. And, you know, it's kind of like of acoustic rock and, you know, some country and, and, and stuff like that. And it was just brought some really beautiful, different sounds to it. And I just think, you know, I tried to stay within my limits once I realized my voice wasn't going to be helping me at all. Sure. So I was very conscious to kind of find where my box was and stay in that box as much as I could. But it was really nice. I mean, people enjoyed it you know, tremendously, and it was just a, a nice, different sound. Saturday night was a House Rockers Halloween party, so that was a ticketed event. We did really well. Nice. Sold the tickets, and, and uh, you know, everybody it, – it's now the second year we've done it. The guys all dress up, really go all out. The people have a great time. And I think the net net of this, it's at a, it's at a big winery with a beautiful event center. The net net of this is that it's a nice, safe, fun Halloween experience for grownups, right? Yeah. So there's, either, you know, there's not 20-year-old, you know, kids looking, looking for different types of music. Everybody's roughly in the same stage of life. People are very nice reasonably affluent, you know, the older people. And it's just a good formula for us to do a ticketed event. It's a holiday. It's a party. It's, um, it, it's, it's at a nice place. Everything helps to justify the value of the ticket. So we charged the wine club members at this winery got $30. The, um, non wine club members, it was $35. And then if you wanted a private table of 10, it was four hundred dollars. the The fifty dollars extra was basically because it's a private table, right? And it was like in the, in the front of the room. You know, there, there were three they, people who got a private table got to get in a little bit early. So we offered three or four benefits along with that to justify the difference between ten individual tickets at thirty five and and a table at four hundred. So it went great. People have a good time. Two years in a row, we've done it. The band gets paid. The venue sells a lot of wine. They love us. You know, sure. it's a nice, respectful audience. No wear and tear on the venue. It just kind of works in all ways. And I, and the nice thing is now after two years, I can say we've kind of created a new little tradition yeah. that is, you know, we can repeat this rinse and repeat year after year. We used to do a Christmas one years ago. I remember yeah. that was, yeah, that was fun. And I, and I, it, I, I actually think for a band that's been around as long as I have, we have those special events are useful in many, many ways. Oh yeah. You know, they are, you, yeah, they you know what I mean? They're, they're like, no, it, I, I totally yeah. get it. The fling fest that we used to do with fling and we're, we're, you know, as we've kind of revamped fling, we've been talking a lot about, okay, wait, wait, let's, let's re let's create something like that again, that, that sort of targets, well, quite frankly, the same crowd, but they've gotten older. Their kids are no longer in their houses. And so, you know, an, an, like an event for adults, but it, I, I think we might still call it a fling fest, it, it, you know, right. but, but those kinds of things like, yeah, make it a thing, not just, Hey, we're playing at this bar, y y you know, uh, or we're playing at whatever this club, whatever, you know, whatever that is that, that, uh, yeah, it, it absolutely, it makes it different. It makes it a thing. And not only does it make it a thing for the people that go regularly and like it, but it makes it a thing for people who have yet to go. And they're like, Oh yeah, I hear about you. You do those fling fests. I, I want to go to one of those, you know, as right. opposed to, Oh yeah. I hear that you play at bars all the time. I, I, I get like, you know, I guess I'll, maybe I'll sometime I'll come out. You, you know what I mean? It's a, it's a, it can be a different thing. If you well, that, that's package the thing is like yeah. uh, the perception of being a bar band is, yeah. is, you know, that's part of your brand. If that's if you, whether you, if you want it to be that great and if you don't want it to be that, consider be the impact in, of that. Yeah, I actually have a whole deep thing it. I want to dive into. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I want to dive deeper into this thing because, you know, we're we're going to about to have our last gig of the year. So sure. so middle of November is our last scheduled gig of the year. We have a pretty good calendar getting a running start into 2023 already. So I'm pretty happy about that. But we've been around a long time and it's always – I always assume that the the long term relationships we have have a shelf life, and they're all going to cancel on <laughs> me in the same year. Like like we're going to have one year where where all of a sudden it's going to be yeah we had last year. Every single one of them is going to do it, and I'm going to have to start from scratch again. So I want to hear about your PSAs, but I thought I'd spend a little time after your PSA, yeah, just kind of talking about where my head is with with the current state of having a band that's, you know, been in a market for 23 years. 
I like it. All right. So we know what we're doing, um, which is great. We're only 15 minutes into the show. This is amazing. We've got the agenda set. Uh, should I hit record now? No. no. <laughs> um, yeah, we had an interesting experience uh, that I want to share because the way that it evolved is equally, if not more important than the final outcome of this. Uh, and I'm going to leave. I th- I'm going to try and leave whatever band it, it happened for me with out of it. And I'm definitely going to leave the name of the, the venue out of this, but it was an interesting scenario where we found ourselves. Eventually we realized that we were in a pay to play scenario without really knowing that coming in. In fact, without knowing that at all coming in. Uh, and I think it's important to share how it proceeded because as I've come to understand, this is not uncommon in elsewhere. So we approached what I'll refer to as a very well-known club here on the East coast of our great United States. Um, a club that has a regional level of cachet, right? Like, like the, you know, the whiskey in LA has, has, has sort of national cachet and also regional cachet. This club's got uh, perhaps not the same amount of national cachet, but it's got good regional, you know, cachet. And I think that's important because I think they're trading a, a little bit on that. Um, mm-hmm. We reached out to them and it wasn't me who reached out. Otherwise, if it was me, I would absolutely be sharing the name of the club, but I, I don't want to burn the, the person in the band that, that does, that does this for us. So we reached out, we explained how we thought we'd be a good fit for an opening act on one of their larger shows. They said, yep, yeah, sounds good. They gave us a few dates to hold while they figured out where they could best fit us to confirm us on, you know, on the bill so far, so good. This all sounds good. Fine. They, a week later, maybe even less than a week later, they come back with a date. This is where things get a little weird. Along with the date, they start giving us things like curfew times and asking us for names of all of the bands that are going to be playing, how much we want to charge for tickets, what time we think we'd want to start, what time we'd want to end. Of course, that has to be ahead of the curfew. Some advice on ticketing prices. And so we were confused at this point, right? Because this was very different than what we had discussed with them or thought we had an opening spot yeah and they said that sounds great like it wasn't tell us what you pay yeah yeah this wasn't a a thing where they like said no we don't do that we do this instead it was like okay fine and there's nothing on their website that articulates any of this so you're you're sort of there's nowhere to research any of these things including all the questions that we asked so we were confused so we went through it a few times, what they had sent us, and then sort of formulated and, and sent in some clarifying questions. And as it turns out, indeed, instead of being the opener, we were now the organizer of this entire night. And so that started to be like, oh, okay, well, this is weird. There was a lot of confusing back and forth as we sorted this out. It was almost, in, in retrospect, it feels like they were answering questions as though they were on a witness stand. They like, they weren't offering up information as much as they were just answering the very specific questions that we'd asked. And also no contract had been sent or anything like Like There was nothing that would have been sort of the go-to document, if you will, to, to be like, well, you should just reference the contract or, you know, our terms and conditions or something that would have answered all of this stuff. No. And, It seemed like a really inefficient way of doing business. And also it started to be feel misleading. Right. Mm -hmm. And throughout this entire back and forth, it dawned on me. There was never any discussion of our payment or how that was going to work. And so all of this, like my spidey sense was like my, the, the hairs on my neck were prickling, you know, very, very, very much. So finally, after several more backs and forths, We get payment information and they start by saying it's strictly a door deal. Now there's nothing wrong with a door deal. We, we, we just played flight coffee. I think I talked about that gig here in, in New Hampshire where, you know, we get a hundred percent of the door. That's strictly a door deal. Works out great. But they followed up with that, that it's not strictly a door deal. Uh, They, they went on to say the club reserves the first three fifty for themselves, $350. And then they will split the remainder of whatever we charge for our tickets. They will split the remainder with us. We get 65, they get 35%. Mm-hmm. It was like, 
Okay, well, wait a minute. So l- let me get this right. We uh, are in charge of organizing the night, uh, pulling in whatever bands we want to have play, uh, f- doing all the promotion, and setting the ticket price. I presume, and I think this is correct, the club would like have a ticket taker at the door and a sound engineer, but for that privilege, uh, they're going to take the first 350 bucks off the top so that they can cover their expenses on, on those people's time, I would presume. And then after that, they so graciously agree to only take 35% of the rest of the proceeds of the evening. Uh, and then, and then the remainder is ours to divvy up amongst the bands that we have hired to fill this night. So we get to do all the work for walling our own event, but with a lot of weird conditions. So we reached, I, you know, we, at, at that point we told them, nah, girl, like it's not going to happen. Uh, <laughs> and, and we had heard from another band that had played there recently after the after they had played there, we had heard from them that they got screwed on the money, but I didn't know what the specifics of we got screwed meant, you know. And so that kept me pushing to get details because they said, just make sure you get all the details up front. I was like, OK, great. Well, now I understand why they said that, because like it was like pulling teeth to get all these details and super inefficient. Like, I just don't understand how uh club that i believe is successful remains that way while like forcing you to go through forcing you and and therefore them to go through you know six different backs and forths with email that that just seems like a terrible way to run a business but I, we reached out to uh, a friend of ours that manages a label here locally and and he confirmed he's like oh yeah this is definitely one of these you know sort of creative pay to play th- 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 vibes uh, paradigms that's been around for a long time. And he even said that pretty much every venue on the sunset strip, uh, like the whiskey or the Roxy, they didn't care about the bill. As long as you were able to sell 50 tickets at 10 bucks a pop, four bands on the bill that made the venues 2000 a night without worrying about promotion, which went to the house and anything over those 50 tickets. Well, then that went into the band's pocket. And that this is a way that some bands have actually made their bones. He mentioned Corn and System of a Down using L.A. clubs in this way. Uh, you know, they had their own followings or they had developed their own followings and then were able to leverage, you know, this model at these clubs to actually be profitable. But for most bands, it doesn't work out that way. And it was like, yeah. So let me ask you a question. I don't what, think we're going to do What it. was it about this that made you walk away? Was it the caginess of the communication or was it literally the financial deal was not reasonable to you? It was both for sure. You know, because it was pretty obvious that there were going to be more things that more surprises, uh, you know, as as things evolved. And it was going to be a lot of work for us to put this bill together in an area that we don't really have a huge following you know, our whole thing was we want to get into this area. So we would like to be an opening act on one of your bills. That's, you know, that's going to draw. We're happy to to come and do that gig. And, uh, and then it was like, no, you, you know, you book the whole night. I was like, yeah, it just, it just doesn't like there's, <laughs> the, the compensation doesn't, doesn't offset the work that we're putting in here. Thank you very much. You know? So I don't know. Yeah, but it was. So I I know that I know that Nick, as he has been booking these tours for the Zappa band, mm-hmm. so he's dealing with kind of theater, you know, three hundred to seven hundred seat theater type places, right? Okay. Yep. And, and he's kind of shared, you know, th- there's always somewhere where the venue takes something to turn the lights on, right? So yep. whether it's the first three hundred dollars, or or you know whatever the percentage might be, whatever it is. So I don't, I don't. When you're as you're telling me that part of the story, it makes sense to me that venue, some venues have said, if you want to play here, we provide basically the venue, yes, the walls, the walls, and you know, and you know, but but Nick has not shared anything with me, and and the two clubs I know that I've done um, splits with. It's very simple. Here's here's the deal. I mean, I think I think both of them is actually on their website exactly what the deal yeah. is, right? So it's it's just really so I I get that the caginess 
would lead you to believe this is going to go further downhill. And then you have another person who also shared they got screwed. So, so that, you know, would leave it. But I, I, I tend to think that there, there is a business model in owning a club where what we do for a living is we're a landlord. We're not a marketing yes. machine. We don't have an audience. We don't, you know, it, so I, I, that's not terribly surprising to me. No, but, but you're right. It, if it were, a, you know, this is a room that holds maybe 200 people, right? So it's, it, but again, it's, you know, it's a, in its market, it's a name brand venue. And I think that's what they're trading on is bands that want to say they played, you know, name brand venue right. X. And so they're willing to, to, you know, do, far more work than they would at any other similarly sized club just to be able to say I played at X and Hey, you know what? If they've built this name up over how many decades and they're able to do that, that fine. That's their equity. Yeah, that, that's, 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 that's their limit. equity. That's it's fine. I just like, it would have been, I can totally understand how this other band got to where they were because they never offered up what the financial deal was. It like they clearly knew that this was possibly to be a sticking point, right? You, you know, and it wasn't until we asked them twice, what so how does the money work that they finally, you know, articulated it for us. And once they did, it was like, okay, this like this doesn't this this doesn't make sense for this kind of room. Uh, you know, on this particular kind of night, it, 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 yeah. none of it fit. I can totally see how this would make sense in a, you know, 500 to 1,000 seat theater. In fact, that's the what most theaters do. Of course, as I've done these kinds of things in larger venues, usually, yes, there is a rev share of the door, but there's also a rev share of the bar. Like it's the whole night is a partnership between the venue yeah. and the band. And with this, they wouldn't let us touch the bar with a 10 foot pole. So, <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, so you're getting 35% of the door for all the work we're doing. Plus every drink you sell is all yours. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, you know, but it, the, I, again, if, it, if this model works for whatever type of show you're trying to put on to your point, great. No problem. Yeah. I, my issue is, with th this, this, this path that we had to walk down and that was more about the path and the caginess. If they were upfront about this, we probably just would have said no out of the gate because we knew that in this particular market, this would be a failure for us right here in, in New Hampshire. Uh, you know, it might be a little different. We, you know, yeah. we might choose, Oh, you know what? We can actually make that work. We've got enough of a following here. Like let's put something together. We'll get a couple of strong bands that can pull that we know. And let's, you know, make a night of it. I also would negotiate with them and they, uh, they never put a bad taste in your mouth that it would be worth a, that something. Yeah. You, their reputation is now in question to you. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. That's, that's silly. It's just but, silly. You know, yeah. Like why not like tell the, me this in the up world front. of rock and roll? Yeah. In the world of rock and roll, it seems like it seems like there's more loosey goosey business than in certainly in tech. I mean, maybe oh, yeah. not more. Different, different. It's different loosey goosey business. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. I, I, you know, club I, owners are are a mixed bag of of uh, qualified business people, to my experience. Yeah, right? yeah, and yeah. It is. Yeah, them, yeah, yeah. I, I really. Some of them play thing some of it's a serious business their livelihood some of them you know it's it's a means to some other ends or whatever it might be and you know and similarly musicians are not are not always the the most ethical business people as well so uh, and not the they, most savvy either so right yeah, yeah. I really want to it. share the name of the club just to one no, don't other. Do it. No, no, don't I'm not going it. to. I, like I said, I, I'm, I'm not going to. But it's because I, I wasn't the point of contact here. If I was, I would yeah. have felt fully comfortable with it. But it's not. It's not my. Not my place to a share bit, this. A little yeah. bit secondhand, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, yeah. It's it is as close to firsthand as secondhand could ever get. But it is still secondhand. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So. Yeah. yeah. So we've been around a while, Paul, and your band's been around a while. And, and we, lots of us have, have bands who have been around a while and we've been through a little bit of an evolution and you're noticing some things. Yeah. So, uh, I'm, I'm starting the process of booking. Well, 
when we finish the summer, I always send a note out to everybody saying, you know, all people we played for, you have first choice of, you know, right of the date that we played for you in the next year, um, sure. you know, until such and such a date, usually end of September. And then after September, I go out and start, you know, figuring out how we're going to fill the rest of the dates. And I've kind of done this process for a while. Yeah. I'm noticing this year that, you know, it's different. I mean, it, the variables, there are many variables. So we were... Coming out of COVID, my phone was ringing off the hook. I mean, I mean, literally, our being around and being a a a a a quantifiable thing was was a big value. And when you say coming out of COVID, you mean last year? Yeah. So this is the second summer that we played. You know, last year. I just wanted to set that straight because, like. Coming out of the words coming out of COVID mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. So I, I just wanted to to make sure we were setting like we're talking about, you know, your summer season of 2021. Right. And then there's everything that that canceled in 19 and 20. Mm-hmm. That was kind of there waiting to rebook. And, you know, but the band has been around a while. And I, I noticed, at least in my area, it seems like there's a lot, a lot of new bands that that are out there in our area now. Um, clubs have different bands in them, you know, uh, there's, uh, different savviness about, about getting a following to come to your shows. I mean, clearly people have, have upgraded their, their social media skill sets to, to a great degree. And so there's a lot going on, but here we are, we've been around for a long time. We had a great run of years where everybody wanted us. Um, we certainly every year go through the, uh, you know, I think we're going to take a year or two off from you guys. We've had you the last two or three years. You know, there's always some amount of, of rinse and repeat stuff going on. Um, but here we are 23 years. We have a following. We're not the pretty young thing on the block anymore. Um, we deliver the goods. Um, and I actually have taken the very conscious tactic of backing off our promotion. So I try not to be as in people's face as much with emails and social media marketing. Okay. And, and kind of letting the, letting it, you know, go down the risk of course, being like, you know, are you guys still together? Which is something that people ask when a band's been together for a long time. Sure. Um, but, uh, my instinct tells me to ease up a little bit, do what we do. You know, we, you know, we have, we have many gigs. Will we have as many as we've had in the past? That's to be seen, but we certainly have many gigs and many good marquee gigs where a lot of people will come see us. And we have these ones that we four wall ourselves, but it is a, a management of expectations. Okay. You know, and, it, and it's a funny thing because, I don't think we had this conversation a couple of weeks ago. I don't think it's in refreshing the the material. I don't I don't think people pay that close attention that a whole new it's not like when, you know, a touring band comes out with a new album and they're promoting that album and you know that's the centerpiece of their their next tour. You, you know, well for a, a I mean for an original band that's 100% important. Right. I don't want to say it's 100% yeah, yeah, yeah. of 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 what keeps your band fresh, but it's very important. For a cover band, it's generally speaking less important. Generally less important. I'll yeah. I'll, I'll give you that. Yeah. Um, we we're gonna mix it up a little bit. You know, we have a big backlog of songs that we can bring back. I actually don't think it's that. I mean, and so the question I I'm left with is, what do you do with a band that's been around for a while to re- reinvent yourself as fresh? Could it be your look? Could it be your your stage shtick? I, and the answer to me is yes to both of those things. Um, or you know the things that we do on stage to entertain, the way that we run the songs together, what we say between you know what songs have audience participation in them. Those are the things that to me seem to be the low hanging fruit for reinvigorating freshness into what we're doing. Huh. But you know it, it, it's just we've played many, again, we're a local band. We play locally pretty much 
a 50 mile radius around San Jose, California is where, is where the house rockers get most of their work. Sure. We have a following and we will deliver the goods. Our following isn't going to come out every week. I mean, we had some summers years ago where we saw pretty much the same people kind of following us around, which was kind of cool. Yeah. But you know, there's some of those people left, but that's not something that's going to last forever. I don't think. Um, so yeah, we're we're just kind of so, so my my answers to myself are, I'm actually going to not get in there and 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 make as much noise. I'm going to be more selective and more precise in the things I want to say about the band moving forward. Not just hey, you know, every night you come see us here, come see us here. You know, so so kind of the the which is what most people do, right? If yeah. if you're playing fairly often, so I'm going to you know if everybody else is going left, I'm going to go right on that. But I think there's just more in, you know, can we do some more key uh, four-walled type things that are the things that other bands can't do because they don't have the following? And maybe it's okay to play a little bit less for a year or two if, you know, if we can. and uh, But have higher impact gigs for a while. So we've done the... We've done the, you know, as many gigs as we can possibly do. And our rate has gone up over the years. And in general, you know, th- we get paid. Yeah. Um, but, but maybe it's time to cut out the ones that are, are you know, blow a line, whatever that line might be, pay, impact, sure. fun, you know, whatever it may be. So maybe when you've been around a while, maybe you make people miss you a little bit, you know, and, you know, and then you can get a little bit of reinvigoration and then pick it up again in a, in a future time. So. Th- those are the things that are going through my mind. Okay. What, what are your thoughts? Well, I, you know, as we're having this conversation or as I'm listening to you here and, and we sort of had a little bit of a pre-chat, so I've had an extra, whatever, 20 minutes to let this percolate, but, but that's about it. And of course I've been talking during that time, so I haven't had much percolation time, but the first thing that comes to mind for me are questions like, is it your band or is it the market? Like do people and people could be the crowd. People could be venue owners or it could be venue owners who are in touch with what their crowds want. Do You know, it, is something different wanted? I certainly see around here. The, uh, the cover band circuit has certainly given up a significant amount of ground to the tribute band circuit. Right. So is, you know, is that, is that what people are looking for now? Is it like, I don't want to hear covers from a bunch of different bands. I want to go hear, you know, somebody do like we had, you know, Bruce on, we talked about Tom Petty stuff, but yeah, you want to go see foreigners journey and they're going to play journey and foreigner tunes all night long, or, you know, Lotus Land, they're going to see rush. They're going to play rush songs. Is that so? The, so my question, like that, that's what goes through my head. And Certainly, you know, I'm put, I'll put on my business brain hat for a moment, which of course is the name of another podcast I do, uh, and, and say, okay, there are times in business and our running our bands is certainly a business. There are times in business when it makes sense to go with your gut. And, you know, I, I know that this is the right thing to do. I'm going to do it. I, I need to see this through. I either need to prove myself right or prove myself wrong. Right. And that's how a lot of great businesses get started. It's also how a lot of businesses start and fail, but that's fine. It, well, it's fine though. Like when when you're when you're an entrepreneur, so many times, especially in the early days, you have to ignore the naysayers, right? You just have to put on your blinders and say, "No, no, 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 no." When you say I can't do this, what you're actually telling me is that you can't do this, and I can't listen to you right now. And you know, you 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 got to pick and choose where you let that sort of advice in and all of that stuff. And if you like that kind of conversation, then, you know, businessbrain.show, but applying this to our bands at some point, especially when you've got decades under your belt, it's possible that your gut isn't going to inform you as to what the right move to take next is. And this is true of any business, not just with our bands. You know, you've been doing it long enough. It's time to take a breath. And instead of, trying to control the market, listen to the market. What's the Mm. market want? And you know, the, the benefit of all of this is you can do your own sort of focus group type things like Facebook, as much as we hate it, it's actually great for this. 
And if anybody's ever done a focus, like a, a traditional focus group, and I know you have Paul in, in, you know, your, your work life, the idea of coming up with enough budget to even approximate that with your band is laughable, right? I mean, you, you know, you're talking about tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars to do a focus group the right way and all that stuff. But with Facebook, you can target your market and and send out a poll to them and ask them questions. And it will cost you, you know, it, it's in the in the order of either tens or hundreds of dollars as opposed to tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars. Right. And you can start to get a feel for these things and ask some of those questions and get feedback from, you know, the people that either are or could be your audience. What are they looking for? And then and then let that feedback go through whatever filter it is you're going to use, because you you only want to do the things that feel right to you with your business, your band, your whatever. So do that, get that feedback. And, you know, we get feedback for this show, which is great feedback at giggabpodcast.com. We love it. And some of the feedback are questions from you and we answer those questions. And some of the feedback is either, well, I love what you're doing with the show. We, we like that. Or I hate what you're doing with the show. We love that too. We don't necessarily let that feedback be the sole driver of what we do with the show next. Uh, I've, I've often found that, you know, especially you, you just get negative feedback from people that say, oh, really what they're saying is I wish your podcast were a different podcast. Okay. Well, that's fine. You know, whatever, like maybe you should start your own podcast and I'll help people get their podcast started. I've done this before. Um, but I've found when I get an email from somebody that says, Hey, you know, here's a problem with your show. If I notice on my first read that it like hits me in a spot that says, yes, they've crystallized the thought that has been forming in your brain, but isn't quite formed. It's like, yes, perfect. Thank you. You've heard that like there's something, you know, we always want to evolve the things that we're doing. And so you do this with your band. You put the, the, the feelers out, you get, you solicit feedback. There will be those golden nuggets in there where somebody says, oh, yeah, well, I love what you do. Wouldn't it be cool if you added this? And you'll say, wait, wait, wait. Yes. I want to do that. And, and allow mm. that to sort of drive you. That's how I do things. I, I can't, you know, I can't say that this is the right path for everybody. My path has been kind of crazy, but, um, but I would say find a way to check in with either your existing audience or the audience you wish you had. Right. You know, and, and see what they want. And does that fit yeah. with, with what you're doing? I don't know. Huh. So I don't I'm know. hearing you say that. And I'm, and I understand you and I understand that this is a, this is a process that you would, that would dawn on you to take in order to figure something out. Yeah. I'm just thinking about, if I, you know, if we got a bunch of feedback saying, you know what, we're really enjoying the whole tribute band thing here. Like, like it would be great if the house rockers did a tower of power tribute, right? The, the amount of acceptance and ability to act on that advice within the band, I think would be paralyzing. Oh, I, and right? I, but that's what I'm saying is it's dis plan to discard 98% of what comes in. So, <laughs> like, well, no, no, like this is, th th this is the, the important part of doing this is don't just look for, we must do what every single person tells us we should do, right? Like you're taking the temperature, but really you're looking for those golden nuggets that resonate with you. So it, when somebody says you should be a tower of power tribute band, that clearly is not going to resonate with you. So you discard it. It's fine. But you know, the things that do come in and, and here's the thing you are, not you don't know right now what it is that's going to resonate with you because the, if this works the way it, I like it to work, the people out there have crystallized the thought better than you have, or they're ahead of you on this scale. Right? So they will say something and, now just fast track to six months because they're like, oh yeah, here's where you're going to get to in six months. They're already there. Boom. They're geniuses. They don't know how important they are. You know what I mean? So I would say I'm more of like the Steve jobs, you know, school of thought that you don't do, you don't do 
focus groups, your job is to know what or, or to give people something they don't know they don't know that they need. But please that don't. Seems even please more don't. True art. <laughs> yeah, but n- none of us can see around corners like Steve Jobs could. I think <laughs> I think we have to accept this, Paul. I I I don't I don't mean to burst your bubble, but I kind of have to burst your bubble here, man. Like <laughs> Steve Jobs was unique in this way, at least in terms of the people that we've been exposed to in our lives. I think expecting to have the ability to to have that sort of insight is um, we're misleading ourselves, perhaps, <laughs> uh, you know, but but but, you know, that's the story that's told about Steve. But I, I he listened to people. He waited. He let people do exactly what I'm talking about here, where he would hear an idea from someone and that would spark. Wait a minute. They don't know what they want. They just told me what they think they want, but I, I I know how to take that and deliver to them what they really want. You know, I think that's where Steve, Steve didn't just sit, you know, closed off from the world coming up with great ideas. He listened to the world. Like, you know, let's, let's look at, you know, the, the, the idea of the personal computer, right? People were building their own computers. Um, and, and it was for nerds, right? But once the nerds had built their computer for themselves, they got utility out of it. And people were saying, yeah, we want more computers that we can build for ourselves. And Steve heard that and said, I hear you. And you, that's what you think you want. And it might be what you personally want, but what the world wants is a computer that's already built. Like most people want the utility that you're getting without the painful nerdy process of getting to the point where they can, they can have that utility. And, and so that that's where Apple computers said, let's build our, you know, that's where they started building computers. Yeah. And obviously it worked out really well, but that didn't happen with Steve shut off from the world that happened with Steve very much exposed to what people wanted and seeing what they would want next or, or, you know, extrapolating that to what other people want. But I think it really matters to listen to what people want and then let that go through your filters. Don't let them d- dictate to you, but take that feedback in. Don't resist that feedback because you don't know what they want until you hear from them. And then mm-hmm. something is going to come in and be like, wait, 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 this, or you'll play a gig or something, do something at one of your shows and it resonates with the people. And you're like, ah, wait, okay, more of that, please. Great, let's do it. And it might be that you find that you do a mini set of Tower of Power tunes. You know, you do four Tower of Power tunes in a row or something, and people might get into that and then be like, oh, you know, they do, they'll do Tower of Power, they'll do Stones, they'll do this, you know, wh- whatever it is, right? And, and I'm not saying that that's necessarily what you need to do for your band, but I don't know. There you go. That's my thought. I will I report know. back. Okay, cool. You got anything else, man? Oh, I'm good, man. Good conversation. I agree. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com, folks. We want to hear from you, even if it's, especially if it's something you think we could do to improve the show. Because like you, we always want to be, What? wait, what is it? What do we say, Paul? Performing? That's it. Always be performing. See you next week. <laughs>